In this video, we'll explore how to increase the current from an op amp. In a previous video linked below, I did present a very simple circuit, but it had some undesirable attributes, specifically at small voltages or at high frequency, it had some really ugly crossover distortion. This circuit does not suffer from those problems. Here's the schematic. You can see the op amp here. I have a load consisting of a series of incandescent light bulbs. That's mostly just so we can see, instead of hear, what's going on. We're still using the TIP41 and TIP42 transistors, but now we have inserted Q1 and Q2, which serve as drivers and we've also inserted this biasing network to place the amplifier into a class AB configuration as opposed to the class B which was used in the previous video. Let's talk a bit more about this driver and power amplifier configuration. We could have used what's known as a Darlington pair. The Basic idea is that by combining two transistors together, you can have much higher gain. In this picture, you can see that the emitter of the driver transistor is connected to the base of the output transistor. And that's fine and certainly would have worked well in this circuit. However, the op amp didn't have a lot of headroom to begin with. For example, this LF412 op amp is driven by plus and minus 15 volt rails. So the plus 15 is on pin 8 and the negative 15 is on pin 4. If it was an ideal op amp, it would be able to swing all the way up to 15 and all the way down to negative 15. It gets close. The problem with the Darlington pair is that you end up subtracting two diode drops off of the output. So in the ideal sense, if you could get to 15 volts positive, you'd end up subtracting 1.4 volts, which means that the best, or the highest output the op amp could give you would be 13.6 volts positive and 13.6 volts negative. Instead, we're gonna use something that's known as the Zeekly pair, or as you see in Wikipedia here, the complementary feedback pair. This is different from the Darlington because we have one of each type of transistor. For example, here, Q2 is a PNP and Q1 is an NPN, right? So you have two different types. Together, these two transistors act as if they were an NPN transistor. So if we go back to our schematic, you can see here Q1, the driver, is an NPN and Q2 is a PNP. Together, they act as if they were an NPN transistor. Same with Q2 and Q4. Together, they act as if they were a PNP transistor with high gain, which works well in this particular application because it reduces the drive requirements for this op amp. We'll emphasize that point by creating circles here. Again, Q1 and Q3 operate as an NPN transistor and Q2, Q4 pair operate as a P and P. That may make it a little easier to understand how this biasing network operates. With that Zigli pair, we have one diode drop from the base of Q1 to the emitter of Q3. Likewise with the PNP, we have one diode drop from base of Q2 to the emitter of Q4. This biasing network consisting of R3, D1, D2, and R4 provides a positive 0.7 volts here and negative 0.7 volts here, putting our pseudo NPN and PNP transistors just into conduction. I should mention R7 and R8 as they do provide a bit of feedback that's useful for thermal stabilization. As a thought experiment, we can consider that this op amp will do its job and make the difference between the input terminals zero 
Another way of saying that is we're going to have a virtual ground right here of zero volts, which means that when there is no signal, this point here is also ground. And now you can consider what happens here. This biasing network should turn Q1 on, which of course controls Q3, such that there's 0.7 volts here. And you could imagine a situation where the transistor Q1 heats up. Well, that would mean it would conduct more. However, if it conducts more, there's going to be more voltage drop across R7, which would tend to turn the transistor off. Long story short, we can expect this thing to have reasonably good thermal stability because these resistors are rather large. While I can't guarantee that it would be thermally stable, I'm fairly confident that given this particular load, it will be okay. If you're going to experiment with this amplifier, you may want to make sure that diode 1 and Q1 are physically close to each other. That way there's some thermal compensation between the two. Likewise, diode 2 and transistor Q2 should be physically close to each other. So as one heats up, the other heats up. If you do that, then you may be able to reduce R7 and R8 to a lower value, giving a higher output current for the amplifier. A natural application would be to replace my dummy load, which consists of these incandescent lamps, with a loudspeaker. And to get maximum output, you'll want to reduce these resistors to a lower value of perhaps 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 ohms. If you're curious, we can calculate the output power. Let's assume an 8 ohm load. Assume plus and minus 15 volt rails, with a further assumption that the op amp requires 2 volts headroom, which gives us a maximum of 13 volts output, with the further assumption that we're going to lose 0.7 volts on the Ziegler pair, which gives us a maximum output of about 12 volts. So plus 12 and minus 12. So volts peak is 12. This yields an RMS voltage of 12 over root 2, which is about 8.5 volts. Therefore, our power out is E squared divided by R, which gives us 8.5 5 squared divided by 8, or about 9 watts. So given this amplifier, in an 8 ohm load, plus or minus 15 volt rails with the op amp overhead, and the overhead required for the Ziegler pair, we can estimate that this amplifier would give you 9 watts. The circuit itself is starting to get complicated from an assembly and breadboarding perspective. Here you can see a top view of the circuit. And here's a side view showing the transistors and op amp. Remember that TIP42 and its MPSA06 transistor operate together as an NPN transistor in a Ziegler pair. And this NPN TIP41 and this PNP MPSA56 transistor operate together as the PNP transistor. Here's that biasing network. There's a resistor here that's a 10K going to the base of this MPSA06, the diode, output of the op amp, then the other diode jumping over to the base of this MPSA56 and then finally back to this 10K. This is the feedback resistor here and the input resistor to this LF412 op amp. Here's the circuit in operation with a very low frequency. I'm using the Digilent Analog Discovery as a signal generator and then I'm viewing the signals 
with an older analog oscilloscope. Let's go ahead and increase that frequency up to something a little more reasonable. Here we can see a faithful reproduction of a triangle wave. If we increase the voltage, it should flat top. As you can see, even with plus and minus 15 volt sources, we don't get 15 volts output because of the headroom for the op amp to operate, plus the headroom for the Zeekly pair, which required one diode drop. In that previous video, we learned that the simple op amp current booster had problems with low voltage. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Here we are, more or less at the limits of my test instruments, and there doesn't appear to be any crossover distortion. Let's go ahead and increase to say two kilohertz. Again, I don't see any crossover distortion. Let's try 20. It still looks good. And let's try say 100 kilohertz. There is distortion, but it does not appear to be crossover distortion. Let's go ahead and bring it up to full power again with an amplitude of one volt peak on the input and the fact that this is an inverting amp that gives a gain of 10. That should bring us back to full power. We can see that the amplitude is down somewhat, but the signal does look reasonably good. Let's go back down to 20K which gives us a signal that looks fairly good. All things considered, I call this a success. The performance is certainly better than the simplified circuit I presented in the last video, yet it's still simple enough that it can be built on a breadboard. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please leave them in the space below.